Max, it's all yours. All right. Thank you. That makes me uniquely qualified to speak to you because of my bachelorness. <laughs> I've been showing a lot. It's teaching time, but I want to try one last thing together. Uh, we're going to play a game. This will teach you a little more about what I do and, and how I think. In order to play the game, you will need a coin. Before you move, a couple of rules. Don't, don't even go for it yet. In a second, I'm going to ask you to dig into your purse, your pocket, your wallet to find a coin. I realize these days not everyone carries change, so if you're lucky enough to have a handful of change, help your neighbor out a penny, a nickel, a dime, a quarter. I need every person in this room to have a coin in their hand and to stand up. Do that now. Coin in your hand and stand up. I mean it. If you don't have a coin, look on the table. There's some buttons. You can grab a button. That might be quicker. So anything you can hide in your hand, a coin or a button. If someone near you is still seated, that means they don't have a coin. Make a friend. Loan them a penny. We will kick this thing off. Get everybody involved. If you don't have a coin, look at your table. There's these little buttons. Pick up a button. Something you can hide in your hand. And we'll kick the game off. Once you have it in your hand and you're standing up, hold it up nice and high so I can see you're ready to play. All right. If you're using a pin, I literally just stabbed myself in the finger. So make sure that the pin is closed. Just check it real quick before we start. Here we go. This is a game my dad played with me. It's a game his dad played with him. It's a game played with a coin or a pin, whatever you're holding. It's a game called Which Hand? You probably remember this old game. Okay? I'm going to play the game tonight against all of you at the same time. Here we go. Take the coin behind your back. You're going to hold it between both hands, between your index finger and thumb, in what I call the neutral position. I'll show you in front of my body what this looks like. Okay? So behind your back, you're in this position. So the coin is just right in between both hands. You're ready to go in either direction. Okay? Here we go. In a moment, I will say the word go. At the moment I say go, you get the coin into whatever hand feels right. You bring both hands out in front of you with your fists closed. So just to be clear, in a moment, when I say the word go, you get the coin into whatever hand feels right. You bring both hands out in front of you with your fists closed. Okay, this time we're playing for real. Go. Hands out, fists closed. Good. Now you will notice in my instructions that I chose my words carefully. In fact, many of you will have noticed the word right used twice. And that will have felt like such an obvious suggestion that as a challenge to me, you'll have placed that coin into your left hand. If the coin or the pin or whatever it is is in your left hand at this moment, have a seat. All right, all right. Settle down, I know you're excited to make it this far in the game, but settle down. Okay, here we go. Those of you left standing, I wanna see how many of you I can get in this final round. Take that coin behind your back. Mix it around, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Bring it out either hand, fist closed. <laughs> uh, you're out. Saw that. <laughs> now, <laughs> two things going through your head right now. Number one, uh, you're probably quite proud of yourself to have outlasted your colleagues. So congratulations on that. The other thing going through your head is that you most likely have done something at this point that you consider cute. You most likely kept it in the same hand. That'd be your right hand. If the coin is in your right hand for any reason, have a seat. There we go. Now those of you left standing, this is interesting. Think about this. In a room of 150 people, four here, three here. If this were a game of 50-50, we would be left with half the room. At this point, those of you left standing, you represent the folks that don't take my suggestions. The folks that don't play by my rules. The kind of people I have a hard time influencing, which means you're just the type of person I'd like to play this game against. Kathleen, you've been smiling the whole time. You look like a good sport. I want you to join me on stage. Everyone else can have a seat. Give Kathleen and all of them a big hand. Hold up, Kathleen. All right, right here. Kathleen, what do you have there? You know, my name is really Kathy, but this is okay, Kathy. Jack was really That's all right. Good. Yeah, yeah. What do you, what do you have? Uh, that's a little hard to see. This will be easier for everyone. Uh, you're going to stand next to me, okay, shoulder to shoulder. We're going to play a couple rounds, okay? Let me see the coin. You're going to do the same thing. You're going to go behind your back. You're going to hide it in one of your hands, okay? But we'll be playing for a little cash, okay? My money, not yours. When you're ready, you come out like this with your fist closed, and then you give me a poker face. All right, turn towards me. Look me in the eye, Kathy. Now I'm going to ask you. I'll say, is it in this hand? You will say no. I'll say, is it in this hand? You will say no. The answer is always no. One of those two has to be a lie. That's okay. Yeah, hold your hands up. 
You don't even have to answer, but this part's fun for me. 20 bucks on the line because I'm feeling good about it. Just say no. Is it here say no? No. Is it here say no? No. Yeah, I already have it, but I'm going to go left hand. Final answer. Show me here. Okay, that's fine. Hey! Okay, take it again. Two more rounds. 20 bucks on the line. Face the crowd. Okay. Now, the first one, honestly, it's 50 50. I have a bit of an advantage. You didn't know exactly what was coming. Okay, this time, think about what you think I think you'll do and then do the opposite, okay? In other words, I wouldn't go left hand again. When you're ready, bring both hands out. <laughs> With your fist close. Good, hands out like this, turn towards me, look me in the eye, hands a little further apart, here we go. As a matter of personality, I have to ask myself whether Kathy would go same hand, that'd be your left hand, or whether she'd switch. For the 20 bucks, I'm gonna go final answer. You don't have to say a word same hand, yeah? Open up. <laughs> That's two, okay, take it behind your back. Last round, last round, final round, okay? Mix it between your hands, you've gone left hand twice. The last one is up to you. This is where it gets interesting. Bring both hands out like this with your fist closed. This will be a non-verbal round, okay? So even if, you, even if I ask you the question, you say nothing out loud, okay? Here's the most interesting part of the game. Because at this point, you've made two choices. You've gone left and you've gone left. When you're back there, you're not thinking, should I go left or should I go right, are you? What you're really thinking is, should I keep it in the same hand again or should I switch? That's all there is to it. And as a matter of personality, I have to ask myself whether Kathy would be so stubborn that she'd go left hand to all three. And that smile confirms that final answer left hand. <laughs> There's a microphone there. Can you grab it for me? I got the Just bring it up here for you. Um, you can win the money, which, which is. <laughs> Now, you didn't lose because the truth is you didn't risk anything, okay? There's nothing to lose. You didn't win the money. And it wasn't about the money. It was to illustrate a point. It was about choices. And while you were up here, you made three choices. You chose to go left, left, left. And the truth is it wasn't the only combination. You could have gone left, right, left, left, right, 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 whatever you want to do. Dozens of combinations. But before you ever opened your hand for the first time, I pulled this bill out. And it's been in your ear the entire time because I actually wrote you a special note on the back of this bill. I'm going to open it up. I want you to read in a nice, loud, and clear voice into that microphone what it says on the back of the bill. You will go left, left, left. <laughs> Your exact choices, yeah? You will go left, left, left. Give her a huge hand, huh? <laughs> All right. So this is a really fun game. I've been playing this for a long time. It illustrates a few things. The first piece of that is when everyone is standing, and that's this idea that language really does influence our behavior. Like robots, I had almost all of you in your seat. I've done this in a room with 5,000 people and had 10 people standing. It literally, language has a huge impact on our behavior and our environment. And it's not necessarily in any sort of manipulative way. It's just that you need to be conscious about the words that you're using because they do actually have the ability to plant a thought inside of someone's head to dictate the behavior that they'll make, whether or not they'll make a decision. The second part of this game was about reading you. It was about looking at your smile, your body language. I chose you specifically because you have a very expressive face. Um, but the interesting thing is as I'm sort of checking my work, I'm also sort of trying to shape your decisions. I'm telling you not to go left and knowing doing that that you are going to go left. And so it becomes a very fun game. And so I've been performing for uh, about 20 years now. I'm 32 years old. I started out when I was uh, about 10 years old as a performer. And I've learned a lot by being a mentalist and being a magician. That really applies to business and to life. And there's two sort of core skills to what I do. And that's one is reading body language. And two, it's about influencing choices and the power of, of language to influence some people's choices. So just to take a few steps back, I had some folks asking me when we stepped out, just a few questions about how I got started, that kind of thing. I'll just give you a, just the quick history. This is, uh, this is me here, not that logo. Okay, it wasn't Brian Haney. He told me it was easy. I'm really pushing this thing. There we go. That's me, age 12 on stage in a green polyester shirt. That's my rabbit Merlin. I've literally been doing this my entire life, performing on stage at an elementary school. Uh, and at a very early age, I learned the importance of controlling attention, of perception, of understanding the way that people perceive you, and actually sort of uh, accounting for that, but also how to read someone else. Um, I've been performing now for about 20 years, and, and the style of, of performance that I do has changed a lot. And the biggest turning point for me was when I was 18 years old, my dad, he actually got hypnotized so that he could quit smoking. And, and I was fascinated by this. I mean, if you could change someone's behavior with your words, I mean, that's like real magic. If you could affect someone's life 
with the words that you say, I thought, wow, that's something that I need to learn. And so I started studying body language and psychology and hypnosis and mixing this with my magic, and that's really led me to where I am now. It's been sort of, I'm sort of a lifelong student of this kind of thing. And so graduating from shows at my neighbor's house to uh, a national tour, this is at Howard Theater, um, actually two weeks ago, 750 people in the crowd. Um, and understanding at any given moment on a stage like this what each person is thinking both keeping the attention of the crowd, but sort of leading them down the path. Um, and so I've learned a lot on stage that I'm gonna try my best to sort of filter through the lens of what you guys do through sales, but also in your personal relationships. The truth is, these topics are universal. It's a nice tool to have in selling, but it makes all of our relationships more rich. The relationships we have with our friends, our family, our colleagues, our coworkers, our customers. It's not just about selling and getting what you want, it's about being a better communicator. And body language is really about listening, not about speaking. Body language is another tool to listen. I really loved your talk. I learned a ton about what I do, just how to frame what I do in terms of someone else's needs. And listening is so important. And think of body language as another layer. It's not about manipulation, it's not about detecting lies, it's about listening. And it's half the puzzle, like Brian pointed out. It's half the puzzle. So we're going to talk about three things. One is reading body language. Wouldn't it be cool to know what someone was thinking? Maybe not at the level of what we're doing up here, but it's oftentimes the things that people don't say that are most important. It's the concerns that they have. It's being able to spot discomfort, these kinds of things in a conversation to proceed maybe in a different direction or to change your tone. We're also going to talk about engineering rapport, to be able to create that feeling with someone the second you meet them like they've known you their entire life. This is something that's scientific that you can do. You can duplicate the feeling of seeing an old friend, someone you haven't seen in 20 years. It's so good to see you. Kind of channeling that energy and how that can convert to friendly or sort of taking sort of a cold lead to a warmer conversation. And the last thing we're going to do is talk about tools of influence, some tricks of the trade if you will. Um, and so body language, really any book you'll ever read on body language starts very simply with observation. It's so simple. Pay attention to it. It's really half the battle. We innately know what these signals mean. We know what it means when someone crosses their arms or when their feet are facing the door, you know, one foot out the door, so the expression goes. You, you guys, you really already know these things. They're hardwired into our DNA. And so simply paying attention to the other person that you're talking to, not just listening to their words. How often are we in a conversation and thinking about what we're going to say next, right? We're often sort of script writing rather than listening. And so really taking a moment to, to not just listen to what the person's saying, but, but watching them and seeing what their body is telling you. You're not going to see these things with your head buried in your phone, right? This is a really common phenomenon. It's something people do to pass time. It's no different than reading the newspaper while you're in line waiting for coffee. It, it's, it's something we've done forever. Cell phones have not created this. It's just easier to see than what we used to do in the past. Cell phones are just visible. Humans have done this forever. Um, and what this is, is it's sort of shutting you out from the world around you. The, the problem with a cell phone is it's a small screen and you're missing everything that's happening. The second you start paying attention to body language, life becomes so much more interesting. You can go and have a cup of coffee by yourself on a sidewalk after you read just a single book and it's, you look at, what is this couple doing? What's going on with them? It's just a fun thing to sort of observe from a distance and start to break down the things that you see in everyday life. Body language makes life so much more interesting. Now, I wondered when I first started studying these things if it was cultural. You know, is it, uh, for instance, in a certain culture, this means what you're doing one thing, in another culture, it means another thing. And the truth is that all body language signals actually are derived through evolution to sort of fit our sort of protective instincts. All these things have been done to help us communicate before there was a spoken language. And so it doesn't matter what language you speak or what culture you are from, these things, these signals are universal. Um, there are a lot of books that will tell you this means X or Y or Z. This is a sign someone's lying. You know, this is every time means someone's nervous. There is no one indicator. There's no universal meaning for any posture. Okay? What matters is context. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What really matters is context. And there's two things that I really want you to focus on that will give you a great foundation for body language. One is open posture versus closed posture. This can be the hands, the eyes, anywhere. It's a really simple thing to understand. It's just ask yourself what you're seeing. Is this an open posture or a closed posture? I wouldn't necessarily use the words positive and negative, just open 
or closed. Because all of these things are derived through evolution. You have the guy on the right, he's sitting very relaxed. He's exposing his most vital organs, his chest, his lungs. Every part of his body where he could be injured is open, meaning he feels very comfortable. Right? Might be kind of a sloppy posture he's exhibiting, but uh, he's very open, very comfortable. The guy to the left is exhibiting closed body language. His legs are close together, his arms are in close. He's not really giving a lot of room for someone else to sort of attack or hurt him. That's a closed posture. And so anything that blocks out, think about your core, everything from here to here, and your throat, vulnerable areas, anything someone does to block that is a closed posture. It's not a negative posture, just a more closed posture. The other piece of body language is what's called pacifying gestures. This is something that's easy to observe, and this is when someone's twisting their hair, or rubbing their neck, or playing with a necklace. Again, this is derived from biology. We do these things because they eliminate anxiety. There are actually glands here in the throat that help eliminate anxiety. We'll play with this area here, same thing. We're just removing, just releasing some hormones to help us relax. This sort of nervous energy, we're channeling this in some way. And so this doesn't necessarily mean that someone's uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that they're lying. It doesn't mean that they're being deceptive. It's an indicator of stress, which can be positive or negative. So just the two things to keep in mind, open or closed, and look for pacifying gestures. Now, none of these things mean anything in isolation. It's about context. Someone sitting here with his arms closed, don't move, with your arms crossed, doesn't mean anything in isolation. Doesn't mean you're guarded, doesn't mean you're closed off, doesn't mean you're resistant to the ideas that I'm sharing. This isn't a negative posture, it's a very comfortable posture to sit in, right? We call this a self-hug, right? It's comfortable, I can sit like this with my arms crossed. Doesn't mean anything in isolation. But what would be interesting, now that we're all paying attention to you, would be if your posture shifted at some point in my talk, if suddenly you became more open. And so it's changes in body language that are important, not any one piece of body language on its own. That's what I want you to keep in mind. Don't immediately assume when you see something that it means something negative. Just look for the changes. Look and see if someone shifts from a closed posture to more open posture, or the opposite would be really indicative if they are in a very open posture, and they shift to a very closed posture during a conversation. Perhaps you touched on something that made them uncomfortable. Maybe that's an avenue you should discuss further to find out why they're uncomfortable, or maybe it's something we shouldn't talk about at all. And so look for changes, opened to closed, closed to open, as signs of comfort and discomfort, and let that lead your line of questioning. Maybe that's a point in a meeting where you stop talking and you ask them what they're thinking. Right? They've just told you something. They've told you that something about my state has changed. Something's made me uncomfortable. Maybe I don't agree with your ideas. A very targeted question would be, you know, I haven't asked you, what would you suggest if we're in a meeting with our colleagues and they're sort of, you know, outwardly disagreeing with what we're saying? What would you suggest is a great question. So don't use these tools as a way of trying to detect lies. Use them a way of, of asking better questions, of knowing uh, where you're going with the conversation. Again, uh, change is key. You're looking for changes in body language, not any one piece of body language. And context matters. You know, again, the, having the arms crossed could just be a comfortable gesture, but crossing the arms after I've just asked a very hard question would be very indicative. And so when am I seeing this body language and what were they doing prior? And so try, when you're having a conversation with someone, when you're out to lunch, when you're in a meeting, start by just getting a baseline. So the first thing you do is just notice what does this person do? Some people just naturally tap their fingers. So it doesn't mean anything by itself, right? So if they're doing this at the start of the meeting and they're doing it later on and you just notice it, you might think that that means that they're nervous, but if it's something they've been doing all along, it may just be a habit that they have. And so establish a baseline and then look for changes in their body language. Um, and so I just wanna go back to this point because this is really important, is resist the urge to read these charts and to look up these signs online and to take any of them at face value because none of these things mean anything in isolation. So just start paying more attention and look for shifts in the demeanor of the person you're talking to from something closed to something more open or from something open to something more closed. And if you just pay attention, you already know the meaning of these things. You don't need a chart to tell you, okay? So one of the last things that I think is that body language is actually the most truthful starting from the feet up. We are taught as children how to use our faces to get what we want. Babies know how to show how to fake being sad, you know? My dog knows how to pretend being sad to get what he wants. Our faces 
Our faces are something we learn to use as a tool to deceive, and it's not as easy to recognize sort of false emotion, but the feet, most people don't think about what they're doing with their legs or their feet. And so look at the things you don't look at in a conversation. Is someone's leg shaking? Has it been, have they been pretty steady? Were their legs open? And now they're saying with their legs crossed. You know, have they become more or less open or closed? Pay attention from the ground up. Those will be the most sort of indicative of their true feelings and their true sentiments. Uh, there's the old saying, one foot out the door. Right? How many times have you been in a conversation at a networking event where the person is sort of trying to, and you've probably done this yourself, I've done it before. You're trying to signal to the other person, you're, you know, we're having a conversation, but my feet are pointing towards the door. You know, I'm already sort of halfway out. And use that as an indicator that maybe you don't overstate your welcome. And so again, pick up on the cues people are giving you, sort of be conscious of their needs and not just to, to spout out what it is or to finish your point, uh, to sort of listen through the cues that they're giving you. Um, in each of these sections, I'm gonna give you just one book that I think will transform the way that you look at your own life. Uh, the first one in this section is called What Everybody Is Saying. How many of you like to read, like really enjoy reading? Raise your hand, okay. Cool. How many of you feel like you don't have time to read but you like to read? Raise your hand. Um, a mentor of mine told me one of the most valuable lessons I ever had, and he said, reading isn't something you do when you have time, right? If you wait till you have time, you'll, you'll never do it. Reading isn't a discretionary task. It's not something, oh, I don't have time to read. You're right, no one does. Reading isn't something you do with your extra time. Reading is work, and it's some of the most important work you'll ever do in your life. And I think it's a really subtle reframe that almost gives you permission to spend time reading when you might often be doing something else. A lot of times you say, well, I need to wait till I have an extra minute. You know, or I feel some guilt when I'm sitting at my desk and I'm reading a book and my assistant is looking at me because from the outside to them, it looks like I'm not doing anything, where in reality, this is some of the most important work you could ever do. And if you're resistant to reading books and you learn better in a format like this, audiobooks are fantastic. For the longest time, I had a hang up about audiobooks. It felt like it's kind of cheating, right? It's not, it's like having a conversation or listening to a lecture from an expert. If I told you that you could sit down with Joe Navarro for three hours and he could tell you everything he knows about body language, would you do it? Yes, of course you would, and an audiobook is just that. It's their greatest wisdom and their greatest knowledge. And the other advantage of audiobooks is that it's done with no extra time. Net, it's a concept to think about, something you do while you're driving. You can hammer out three books in a week during your commute. And so think about reading as work, not as a discretionary task. For me, it was a major shift in mindset and a major change in my priorities. So a little off topic, uh, but I think a really important lesson. So we're gonna step into engineering rapport. And this, I think, is something that will dramatically improve your conversations and your relationships that you're having. Rapport is the feeling that you have when you're talking with someone like you've known them your whole life. And you can actually recreate this simply by channeling the energy that you want to have in that conversation. So right now, think about the feeling you would have if you were walking out in the parking lot and you ran into a friend of yours you hadn't seen in 10 years, someone you wanted to see, okay? Think about how that feels. How have you been? You know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a way that you, it's an energy you feel inside of you. It's not anything fake you have to do with your face, but I, it's, you can feel it. You can feel it, and you can embody that when you say hello to someone. And it's a little shift in your attitude that will change everything. Try it when you walk up to the, the, the motor vehicles or to the airport counter. Think about the person, reframe the person on the other side of the counter as if they were someone you hadn't seen in 10 years and you're so excited to see them. You don't have to think about what you're doing with your face or anything. It will shift your entire behavior. And suddenly it goes from, uh, hey, how can I help you? Oh, I'm going to Dallas, too. Hi. Wow, it's transformative, right? Like, you can, you can say hello to someone in such a way. Have you had this experience before where someone said hello to you, and you're like, do I know you? And it's just an energy they're giving off, the level of comfort that they're giving off. And so really, you can embody this intention when you're walking into a meeting, or you're walking up to a counter, uh, where you invoke the feeling that you have if you saw a friend you've known your whole life, and that creates instant rapport. You can do this in under a minute. Um, there's a few other things you can do once the conversation starts, but this is just something to think about before you even ever say hello. It'll change your tone of voice. You don't have to consciously do it. Your body will react to this kind of emotion in the channel. So rapport is really about feeling a connectedness to someone, and again, this can happen before you ever say anything. Um, but there are a few things you can do in a meeting 
or uh, in a group setting or when you're standing and talking to someone that can instantly put them at ease. There's something called mirroring, okay, in body language, uh, which is literally where in the first minute of meeting someone, you copy their body language. Don't move, I'm using you as my example all day. Freeze right there. Imagine we just sat down for coffee. I'll pull my chair up so everybody can see. Okay, I would do exactly what you're doing. And I know we're talking about it right now and it feels weird, it feels like, oh, he's copying me. No one will ever notice this. It's the most natural thing in the world. You just do exactly what they're doing or a version of it. For instance, uh, if you're a guy with short hair and a woman is twirling her hair, sit with your arm up. So the same hand she's using, you're sitting in the same way. And what this does is it puts you on the, on the same emotional state that they're in. They're, they're, they're sitting a specific way because they feel a certain way. And this will make them instantly comfortable. Now here's the really fun part. Just sit, live in this for about a minute to 90 seconds. And then what you're going to do is you're going to shift your posture from a closed posture like they're giving you to a more open posture. And I swear, like a puppet, they will react. And it's crazy. When it happens in your head the first time, you're going to want to go, oh my gosh, it worked, right? You're right in the middle of a meeting. Um, don't really, you'll think this, but don't react. Uh, but be, be glad that it worked. And so we're sitting here, we're talking for a minute, you know, how's your week been, whatever's going on. And I would just shift and open up and I'd lean in a little bit. So I'm going from closed off to completely open and leaning in, expressing more interest. And like a robot, you would do the same thing and suddenly we would have this instant connection and rapport. If that doesn't happen, you need to spend a little bit more time synchronizing your behavior. So just go right back to what you were and keep testing that connection. And it will transform the energy that you have in any conversation with a loved one, with a business meeting, with anyone. And so just mirror their posture and then adjust your posture after you feel like you've built a bit of a connection to something more open. And when it happens to you the first time, you're going <laughs> to want to laugh out loud and stand up because it's crazy. It's almost like they're a marionette on a string. Uh, the other thing you want to do to mirror someone is to match the rate at which they speak in their tone of voice. I have a habit of being very loud and talking very fast. And that can be very disarming for someone who's maybe a little more quiet and it talks a little bit more slowly. And so I have to consciously slow down. Maybe I lower my tone of voice to match the rate at which someone else is talking, the speed, the volume, because it's really off-putting. And we don't know why, but viscerally we'll feel it when you're sort of in a relaxed, calm state and someone else is almost shouting at you. And so if you are a person who tends to be kind of loud or if you are a person who tends to be kind of quiet, at least for the first few minutes of the meeting, try to mirror and do this on the phone as well. Pick up on the energy the person is giving you. If they're you know, speaking kind of slowly, don't just fire into your rant or whatever you want to say. Take your time with the conversation. You'll get a lot further if you mirror them both in body language or just through your tone of voice um, as well. And so this is just not just for in-person meetings, but also on the phone. Um, and this is that uh, marionette moment, which the first time it happens is, is really fun. So play with that uh, tonight when you go home at the dinner table. I think you'll, you'll have some fun with it. Um, I want to give you some practical takeaways, some tricks, if you will, that you can use uh, to build rapport in a room. Um, at a networking event, you can create instant rapport with a group uh, through the way in which you approach the group. It's a really hard thing, even for someone like me who's a performer, to walk up to, you're at a networking event, maybe you came in late, or maybe it seems like everyone knows each other, and you're sort of the person on the outside looking in, and everyone's experienced this. There's a group of people, you want to approach them, and you just don't know what to say or how to insert yourself or you go and linger by them and you just kind of listen for a while until someone asks you who you are and it always feels awkward. And there is a great strategy that I've come up with uh, that I call CIA. This is a really fun formula. Uh, this is one you can take away and do tomorrow. This works for networking events. This works for trade shows. If you have a booth, then you're trying to sell your stuff at a conference. Uh, it's a great formula for stopping someone who has somewhere to be. Uh, and disarm them, and I call it CIA, and it's compliment, introduce, and ask a question. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to give them a compliment, and when you do this, it disarms someone. You're not asking for anything. Hey, can I have a second of your time? Hey, my name is so-and-so. You're not selling. It's very disarming. So the first thing you do is give a compliment. Hey, cool backpack, whatever it is. The next thing you do is introduce yourself. I'm Max. Ask a question. You've been to this conference before? 
and suddenly you are in a conversation. You're literally in a full-blown conversation. And this takes away so much approach anxiety when you're trying to talk to a group or you're trying to stop someone at a trade show. I watch these people with clipboards on the street in Washington, D.C. And people are trying to walk by, hey, do you have a second? Hey, can I, if you lead with a question, right? Number one, you're probably interrupting a conversation. At least if you lead with a compliment, no one feels bad about it. Great one-liner for complimenting a group. You guys are in a conversation. Maybe it's a happy hour, it's a cocktail event. Don't try this here because everyone will have already heard it, okay? Um, this is my favorite one. You look like a fun group. It's like, who's going to say no to that? No, we're not fun, go away, you know? You look like, oh, we are fun. Wow, we are a fun group. I'm Max. How do you guys know the host? Or have you been here before? Or tell me about, uh, I can't read your name tag from here. Tell me about AXA advisors. And you're suddenly, you're in a conversation. Uh, and so it's a great way to just give yourself a formula. And once you're in, you can do the rest. We all know how to have a conversation, but it's like starting a conversation, that's a tricky thing. And so before getting to the common ground stuff that Brian talked about, this gets you in the door. And then from there, and it's not a trick, it's not deceptive, it's it really, it's a tool uh, to, to sort of get you into a conversation, and it sort of gives you permission to interrupt people. Uh, but when someone's moving by to compliment on their shoes or their bags, or hey, where'd you get that yardstick, or whatever it is that they, they have, so you're not asking them for anything right up front. So compliment, introduce, and ask a question. Another great line for a networking event is, I haven't met you yet, I'm Max. Which implies instantly that we should have met. Right, it's this idea of reports. Like, oh, I haven't met him. What? Should, am I supposed to know him? How, how do we? Yeah, haven't met you yet. I'm Max. Works works wonderfully. And then suddenly you're. Well, how should I know you? You know. All right. So rapport um, is really also about listening, and this is something that every speaker up here has said today, but just try it out. When you go to a networking event, don't talk about what you do. Don't try to sell a single person in the room. Like, treat it as a challenge. The next time you go to a networking event, to talk about yourself as little as possible. It sounds so counterintuitive, but people who are interested are interesting, right? People who show interest in you are interesting. The more questions I ask you about your business, the more interesting I become. So by being interested, I become interesting. And you can ask someone so many questions about their business that eventually they'll be dying to know, oh, oh my gosh, I'm talking about myself. What is it that you do? And now you haven't tried to sell them or anything, uh, and you're sort of, you have permission without asking to talk about your business. Uh, but I try sometimes to not even do that, to just really, because it creates a huge shift inside your head to not talk about what you do. Just ask as many questions as possible. Who are you trying to meet today? Tell me, what do you guys do? Who's the best person for you to meet in this room? And then keep that in mind, and as you move through the room, try to find someone else who is in that business and make that connection, right? So I'm trying to find someone who does life insurance. Okay, great, here I can put you two together. And now suddenly you're the guy that's really interesting, that's connecting people, and naturally everyone eventually will want to know who you are and, and what you do. Um, there's a great book with a very infomercial sounding title uh, that everyone in this room should read. It's called Make People Like You in 90 Seconds. Terrible title, uh, but a fantastic, fantastic book. It is not as hokey and as infomercially as it sounds. Uh, this book is about rapport. This book is about the, the first 90 seconds of a conversation and approaching groups, and it will transform the conversations that you have following that. It'll transform the way in which you talk about your business and the way in which you sell. All right, uh, and we're moving on to tools of influence. Uh, where am I at on time? Is there an official timekeeper? 12 minutes. Okay, cool. There are a number of tools of influence, but one that every person in this room will know right away is authority. We respond to authority in two ways. You're an authority on a subject, or you have authority. You stand a certain way, you have a certain tone of voice, you wear a uniform, okay, whatever it is, we respond naturally to people and authority. And here's a really, really cool application for this. And so authority is a mindset as much as it is a uniform. And I want you to think about it in the context of the phone calls that you're making when you're trying to get access to someone. And so you have a very big prospect, he's a new CEO at a company, he's a chief marketing officer, uh, whatever it is, you're trying to reach them, you're gonna have to go through a gatekeeper. Okay, and the people that answer the phone, the secretary, they don't know every person that the CMO knows. They don't know every person that the CEO knows, but they are expert at detecting bullshit, right? <laughs> they really are, and we all naturally know this. We, we all naturally can smell it. Uh, I was a bouncer at a nightclub in college, and you could always tell when someone said they knew the owner, you could tell, I don't know what it was, but you knew right away whether they really did or whether they really didn't. And it really comes down to tone of voice. 
And so to embody authority on a phone, it comes down to tonality. And you don't even have to try. Just think about what it sounds like to speak with authority, you know? Hi, this is Max. Is Van there? <coughs> Shit, he must know him, right? Versus what does a normal call sound like? Hi, this is Mary. Thanks for calling Coca. Hi, Mary. How you doing today? Yeah, this is Max. I was, is it, I was hoping that, uh, is Randy in today? Would I be able to speak to him? Uh, no, unfortunately. What is this regarding? Well, you know, I wanted to talk to him about... Too late. You're not getting through, right? Uh, and so your tone of voice oftentimes is simply enough. And so it's the way in which you, you ask the question. Uh, when I call my manager at his office, he, he has a, a huge PR firm, 40 employees. Not every person that answers the phone there knows who I am. Uh, but when I call, they always put me through right away. And I don't think it's because they know their name. It's because I'm not embodying anything. I actually know the guy. And when I call, it's really simple. Hey, it's Max. Is Richard in? Every person that answers the phone in there can instantly feel it. Like, oh, he knows this person. I should probably put him through to Richard. Um, and so usually that will get you there. I would say more than half the time that is enough to get you on the phone with the person. It's just sounding like. Uh, so we're never going to lie, okay? Uh, but we're going to be a little vague, right? But we're never going to be. We're never going to lie. We're never going to be deceptive. And so tonality is number one. Number two is to control the conversation. You're the one asking the questions. Okay, and number three is to never sell the gatekeeper. So you're never explaining to the person that answers the phone why they need to put you through, because that is their job to prevent that from happening. Um, and so let's run through just, just a couple examples. So uh, I wanted to do some marketing work for Coca-Cola, and I found uh, through a connection uh, the direct phone number for the chief marketing officer of Coca-Cola. And I called the number, and an assistant answered. I'm gonna use the name Bob. And I said, uh, is Bob in? This is Max Major. She said, what is this regarding? I said, just tell him it's Max. And she put me through. <laughs> so where to God? Didn't lie. I didn't see anything. But it was just, it was the, it, I just embodied this sort of tone of voice you have when you call someone that you actually do know. Right? Just tell him it's Max. It's a great, great line. Um, and, and think about that in contrast to the typical sales call. Now, you better know what you're going to talk about when that person answers the phone, and I was ready. I was very prepared uh, for, for that call with him. Um, but uh, but that's, that's sort of taken for granted. You should know your stuff, and you should know what you're going to say to that person once you get them on the phone. But honestly, that's half the battle. If you could get through to the person that you're trying to reach, uh, think about how much higher your close rate would be instead of getting pawned off to secretaries or assistants or whatever it is. Um, so another couple examples. Um, so uh, this is Max Major. I was calling for Richard. What is this regarding? Just tell him it's Max Major. She comes back. Uh, I'm sorry, he's not free right now. Did you tell him it's Max? Send her back again. Like, make it a challenge to see how many times you can send the assistant back to the person until eventually he's like, just, just put him through. You know, they're just sick of this game. Go, well, what does he want? Well, who does he work with, you know? Um, so it's just it's just the tonality. It's a way in which you approach a conversation. So did you tell him it's Max? And she says, well, what is this regarding? Say, who is this? So just turn the question around. So you're controlling the conversation instantly. Who is this? Well, I'm his assistant. And what's your name? Mary. Well, Mary, did you tell him? Did you tell him it was Max Major. I did. Okay. So it's just reframing and, and just as a game, see how many times you can get this person to go back and eventually put you through. Usually it won't take 10 layers of this. Usually it's simply in your tone of voice. A lot of times you'll have a loose connection. More likely you have a loose connection to that person. They gave you your card. They probably do this a lot. They expect to get a lot of sales calls. You have permission to call them. It's not a cold call, right? Um, and most of the time, that'll, that'll get you through the door. And so it's tonality, it's controlling the conversation, and it's uh, never selling the gatekeeper. That's really important. If you launch into a diatribe about how you want to save him money, or how you want to change his business, or how you want to protect his assets, um, they get 100 of those calls a day. So uh, approach it as if it were someone you work with all the time. Treat it the same way in your tone of voice. Treat it the same way in your line of questioning. You're not going to be condescending, but you are going to embody authority um, in such a way that this person feels like, oh, maybe I should put them through, because if I don't, maybe I might, I might get in trouble. So that's a fun one. Uh, I love influence. This stuff is really fun. 
Um, the other piece of authority, and this is another one you can take away, is the way in which the person answers the phone who's the gatekeeper for you. So let's turn it around. And you can establish authority by how the secretary answers the phone. If you have anyone in your office that just fields general calls, whether they're your assistant or they just answer the main number for the office, if they can establish authority for you, the person that they're passing the person off to, they can actually up your close rate by 15%. And so Mary answers the phone. She says, you know, how can I help you? I'd like to speak with someone about such and such. Let me pass you off to Van. You know, he's got 43 years in the industry. Uh, he's the guy you want to talk to instead of just, I'll transfer you to Van. And that sort of statement of his credentials or his accomplishments of his authority actually will up your close rate uh, by as much as 15%. And so just a little tweak to the script that the person answering the phone gives. And this can be about your firm or, or whatever it is. Um, gifts. I'm, I'm definitely going to run over here. Uh, I saw a lot of gifts and tchotchkes out on the tables. These are great. Uh, the reason that gifts work is because of this idea of reciprocity. When you give someone something, they feel like they have to give you something back. And what they found is it doesn't have to be anything of any significant value. There was a fantastic study regarding waiters and the mints that they leave with checks. Are they leaving you the mints because they want you to leave with good breath? Or maybe... Are they leaving the mints because it helps their tips? And waiters know these things intuitively, but they don't know why they work. When I was a bartender, you, you didn't know why these things work. You just did them kind of intuitively, but they did research on this. And so uh, option number one, they bring the check, no mints, standard tip. They establish a baseline for that. Option number two, they bring the check with one mint per person in the fold. Tips go up 5%. They didn't say anything. They don't acknowledge the mints. Table of four four minutes in the billfold, you feel like you're receiving something. Option two was that uh, they actually included two minutes per person. So if there's a table of four people, they put eight minutes in the billfold, it seems a little generous. Again, they don't say anything about it. Tips went up 14%. Okay, and then the third one, this is my favorite one, was they had one minute for each person in the bill. They set down the bill, they started to walk away, and then right before they walked away, they said, ah, you know what, for you guys, and they just drop a handful of minutes on the table. Like a little something extra special for you. Tips went up 24%. Fascinating, fascinating. And the reason that this works is twofold. One is reciprocity. It's this idea that a gift makes you feel indebted subconsciously in some way. You wanna give a little more to someone. But it's also the personal touch. The reason that that last example works so well is because it wasn't just something mechanical that they do. It was something that they saw. This person went out of their way to give me more mints. See that it gives a handful of mints. This guy's awesome, 24% more tip. Um, and so you can treat this the same way in your business by sending gifts to prospective clients uh, or to clients that you already have. And they can be little things. They don't have to be expensive because the mints prove the point that it's anything. You can get mini Rubik's Cubes, those little things I have, keychain Rubik's Cubes. They cost you less than a dollar each. You can send them to your 100 best clients with a little note, something quirky, puzzled about your financial situation, whatever it is, we'll help you figure it out. You can send a series of these gifts in sequence. And then when you call, you're the guy that's been sending those weird or quirky things. Um, and this works because of reciprocity, but it also works because of the personal touch. It's something no one else is doing uh, that makes you human. Because again, we're doing, we're doing business with humans. Two great books on these topics. Number one, Influence. Uh, this is just such an entertaining read, but it has real applications to your business. Influence by C.L. Dini. But if you just type in Influence on Amazon, this is the one that will pop up. The next book is one that hopefully some of you in this room have read, Chet Holmes. The Godfather of Sales, The Ultimate Sales Machine. If you have not read this book in the field that you guys are in, I mean, this has helped me in my business, but an industry where you're all about prospecting, this will change your life. This book changed my life, and I sell goddamn magic shows. So if you're selling a product, if you're selling a product where everyone is your customer, which is what you guys are doing, um, this book has the most solid psychology I have ever seen in the selling world. Um, and that is all of my information. Um, I love talking about this stuff. That is my cell phone. That is my email. You can call me. I will not pass you through my assistant, and I mean this. Uh, if you're interested in this stuff, if you read these books and you want more reading, send me a note. If you forget the books or you want the slides, send me a note. Uh, it's my Twitter at the bottom if you guys are on there. So I, I just, I'm really passionate about these topics, and it's, we call it tricks of the trade, but these aren't tricks. I mean, these are, these are human tools that are hardwired into us to make us better communicators. It's not about manipulating someone else. It's about having deeper conversations, and that is no trick. Thank you, guys. And we've chosen to work with fighters for the new TV show because they really are the embodiment of 